Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark. And every week we try and bring you an exciting guest from the University of Hawaii to explain some of the new research, either in planetary science or, as in the case today, earth science. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Warren McKenzie, who is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics at UH Manoa. And Warren, you have just returned from an exciting trip over the Christmas break um, to the Republic of Congo. So welcome. Yeah, much more exciting than I thought it would be. But <laughs> and, and this sounds like a fascinating thing for a graduate student to uh, be engaged in. But get right to the start of it. Where is the Congo? Where, so where are... Congo is one of the largest countries in the world. So where I was in the Congo is kind of in the dead center of Africa as opposed to one end on the coast. So right on the border with Rwanda, uh, uh, almost about three kilometers away from the border was where And I was thanks to Google time. Earth, our first image, I think, will help the viewers actually understand where it is you went. So here we've got two images, whole of East Africa on the left-hand side, and a more detailed map. And I guess the red dot is where you went. Well, mostly actually Goma, so right south of the red dot, uh -huh. kind of bisected by the border. But and the red dot is definitely the fun part. <laughs> and so a lot of questions like, why did you go there? How did you get there? What? So I have a, a lifelong love of the interaction of humans and geology, and particularly volcanoes, and the challenges that people face, particularly in areas where geological hazards are secondary to some of the other problems that people face in their everyday life, or even tertiary in the case of the Congo. And uh, I reached out originally to the Volcano Observatory about 10 months ago asking if I could possibly come visit, to no response. And I have a friend who works in Kinshasa, and he was passing through Goma, and I said, can you just take a letter of reference from, or a letter of intent from me and a copy of my resume and hand it to them? Okay, so back up a bit. Yeah. You're studying volcanoes. So yes. You're, you're a volcanologist, but we have volcanoes here in Hawaii. And Why I, not study I, them instead? Well, I also study ones on Mars, so it's not particularly uh -huh. that much farther away to look at the Congo than Hawaii from Mars. <laughs> oh, good point, yes, yeah. And, and, and what, what exactly do you do when you study volcanoes? So uh, a lot of what I work on is remote sensing work and satellite data from Mars, none of which translates particularly well to being on the ground in the Congo. Okay, we've had people like Casey Hannibal yeah. and... Uh, Estelle Bonney, who are doing some remote sensing. So basically, for new viewers to the show, remote sensing means that you collect data at a distance. Extreme distance, yeah. So extreme distance. Satellite-based data from around Satellite-based data looking at, at the Earth. And going to Congo uh, gives you new opportunities compared to studying them here in Hawaii? Congo gives you a different insight into people. Hawaii has its own unique problems when dealing with volcanoes and dealing with the hazards that volcanoes present to human populations. But, for example, there's no heavily armed rebel groups in the foothills of Kilauea. I'm pleased to hear that. Good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. And, and so um, you went there to study what volcano? I was primarily working with Nyiragongo and just in the park around Nyiragongo. Nyiragongo, and I think we've got another picture. The second slide should show us. Here is one of the photographs which you took, and it looks a little bit different from either Mauna Loa or Kilauea. It's much more steep-sided, is that true? Yeah, it uh, tends to just have a very steep flank to it, and getting up it, there's no switchbacks, it's just straight up for uh -huh. to 14,000 feet. Does that mean it's made of different uh, chemistry lavas, or? It's still a uh, Hawaiian-style eruption with similar compositions, but it's less prone to major flank eruptions like you see at Kilauea than it is. It looks quite similar to uh, some volcanoes I've seen in the Galapagos, for example, which have small volume eruptions near the summit and big ones near the flanks. Is it, would that be a, a fair comparison? You know, you're going to know far more about the Galapagos than I am. So. <laughs> okay. But, but your goal, in part, was to understand a bit more about how 
Nungongo erupts or to collect? What kind of data were you hopefully obtaining? So I only had a week, so I wasn't even involved with much data collection beyond uh, some gas analysis and some fissure extension measurements, looking at behavior of lava underground. And fissure extension measurements would mean what? So we were climbing down into these uh, fissures that were responsible for feeding the 2002 eruption, and they had bolts on each side, and then we would just take a series of measurements and see if it had expanded recently or contracted. All right, so and but by measuring how much expansion one of these fissures has, you're trying to see if the volcano is still growing? Or if there's a new potential eruption coming from the same rift zone that led to the 2002 eruption. Okay, so it was not erupting when you were there? The lava lake was extremely active. Uh -huh. uh, it was not erupting into the middle of Goma, which is Good. very thankful for everybody there. Okay. But they actually did see extension. Recently in November, they had a, a big shift in the measurements. But, but it must be a fascinating experience to go to this part of the world, right? Uh, and <laughs> You, you brought along a number of images. Let's take a look at the third one, which I think, yeah, th th this is not volcano or mountain view on the big island. This is something completely different. So explain to the viewers what it is we're looking at here. So this is a, a shot that I had to be careful getting because right behind that truck is a couple of guys with machine guns. And that bamboo post there, if you drive past it, I imagine they would be very excited to use them. So this is the marking line between what's military held, just past that as a UN base, and just past that you're in rebel territory. And, and the, the bamboo, that's supported on that vertical black and white post. Just like a traffic cone just, almost. Just like a traffic cone. So in addition to um, sort of just the, 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 the less vibrant economy, you also have to deal with rebels, right? We did have to deal with rebels. That was kind of surprising to take that from an abstract, oh, I guess there are rebels, to, oh, I guess the guy standing in front of me with a gun is a rebel. Uh, so it was an adjustment of uh, expectations and thinking I'm prepared for something to, now I have to be prepared for something. Right, right, right. Yeah, all the field work which I have done is in relatively benign areas. I mean, I can't imagine trying to deal with some of the logistics of personal safety from um, a rebel perspective as opposed to just you know, hiking out in the wilds mm -hmm. without anybody to support you. Sort of thing. And the Volcano Observatory has done an amazing job working with the populations that live near the volcano, which includes everybody. They've kind of, they're responsible for the safety of a city of over a million people. And the rebels don't seem to particularly want to be responsible for interfering with that hazards monitoring. Huh. And at the same time, they make sure that everybody's informed, the information's all public. So it seems they largely get left alone. Okay, so you were based out of the Goma yes. Volcano Observatory. Yeah. And we've got a picture uh, which sort of shows the, um, the frontage and uh, a scientist at bottom left who's working on his computer. How, how big a facility is this? Do they have the same kind of research that the Hawaii Volcano Observatory on the Big Island would conduct? It's actually a fairly large facility and it's fairly well placed, but it's uh, obviously the equipment is a different concern because they're working a lot with old equipment. They don't have the money to buy state-of-the-art research equipment. And then at the same time, you have the logistics problems of working in rebel territory. So a lot of it is just extensive engineering to keep equipment online and functioning and generating good scientific results years after something like H or somewhere like HVO would have just kind of gone and said, well, we need new equipment now. We can get... How many people work there? Uh, the core scientific staff seems to be around a dozen and a change that I interacted with, but there's a solid 50 people working there in any other capacity as well. And, and some of them have PhDs in geology? Some have or? PhDs in geology. Some people really should have PhDs in geology for all the work and research mm -hmm. they do. And uh, if it's actually possible to go back to that photo that yeah, was there for I, half I a second, can, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> I should point out the SOAS sticker from the University of Hawaii. That was not brought by That's me. That's the gut, the gut science The gut sticker science sticker. On the, on the laptop. It turns yeah. out that the uh, Goma Volcano Observatory has significant ties to UH almost by accident. Really? They've all uh, individually come to CSAFE, which is a 
project on the Big Island. And the Center for Study of Active Volcanoes. Yes, yeah. and then several of them have actually done courses at UH for a single semester. And it was kind of strange to be so far from home and so far removed. And there's Hawaii stickers everywhere, and people have ties to Manoa. And How interesting. And know the faculty members. And it's like, oh, do you know so-and-so at UH? And it's like, oh, this is very comforting, it's, actually. <laughs> it's, well, it's great that yeah. you know, we, we at least host professional scientists as well as students to get further education mm -hmm. on how do you study active volcanoes. And are they doing the same kind of research that HVO would do in terms of gas studies or deformation? They are, but a lot of it comes with much different uh, concerns than you would deal with in Hawaii. For example, the big rift zone is in the middle of a shanty town. Okay. So you have to do it's your... Not good. Well, <laughs> it's where you can build if you're not that well off in Goma. Uh -huh. And they had to do some demonstrations, not while I was there, but I got to see footage of them where they basically showed children what happens when they brought a goat into a depression and it was filled with carbon dioxide. They resuscitated the goat, it was fine, but it's, uh, it just passed out. So the carbon dioxide being released? Is right in the middle of human areas, and if you're a small child, it's really dangerous. Yeah, it sounds... Obviously, the CO2 issue isn't so important, but like Ocean View Estates on the southwest of zone of Mauna Loa on the Big Island is similarly, you know, is a housing development along an active part of the mm -hmm. volcano. So it, it, is volcanic hazard research one of the main things that GOMA Observatory is concerned with? It's one of the things they're really concerned with. Uh, the, when the 2002 eruption happened, it actually ended up cutting the city in half the lava flows were traveling at about 40 kilometers an hour, which even compared to a lot of what we see in Hawaii with the slow advancing lavas, it's not quite the same. That's really and then fast. It's a steep slope. Yeah. And then it bisected the city, and one half of the city actually had to flee into Rwanda and become displaced refugees. And the other half had to flee deeper into the Congo. Although, how, how long did the eruption last? Were they able to relocate or... Is this sort of a semi-permanent It wasn't semi-permanent, but it was kind of compounded a little bit by the fact that the government was concerned with rebel groups moving in. Uh -huh. So the order to evacuate was a bit delayed because they didn't want to suddenly have the city taken over by armed rebels when everybody was gone. And so it's this just a lot of math going between the hazards people and the government's concerns. Which must put a lot of pressure on the Goma volcanologists. Can we actually have the confidence to order an evacuation, recognizing all of the problems we had on the Big Island? Uh, the Puna lava flows may have forced people to evacuate there, mm. but certainly you don't have this level of risk and uh, conflict going on. Yeah, and at the same time, the Puna lava flows were much better monitored than we see in Goma. And so, slower moving. And as much well. slower moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. Could just walk up to them and kind of take your measurement. Whereas, you know, 40 kilometers an hour down slope in a shanty town that can bisect a city and create refugees or cause a civil war is just... It must have been fascinating to hear, hear some of these conversations then, because as you've mentioned, you know, we don't have this kind of concern here in Hawaii and many of the other volcanoes which are around the world similarly lack this kind of social pressures. Yeah, it was just an unbelievable thing that I thought I was prepared for going in uh -huh. and there's no amount of reading it or reading about it that you can prepare yourself for be standing in the shanty town talking to people who have to live with this every day they've turned one of the rift zone like one of the active rifts into a boulevard yeah. between the shanty houses. well we're getting near the break time yeah. one but when we return I'd like to see some more examples of what exactly the place looked like and also try and figure out you know <laughs> What background does a student need in order to get permission to go into the Congo? So um, let me just remind the viewers, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today is uh, Warren McKenzie, who is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH. And we're talking about his recent field trip to uh, Congo, where he was studying Nirongongo volcano. And we'll be back in about a minute's time.
I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O. And I'm the guy that says let's go. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark. My guest today is Juan McKenzie, who is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. And we're discussing Warren's recent trip to Republic of Congo, where he was studying one of the active volcanoes called Nirungago. Now, Warren, let's get to some of the other pictures which you took, because sure. I doubt very much if people really know what that setting is like. So, what is it we're looking at here? This is actually my office view. Your office this view? This is my office view, and if the weather was a little less uh, hazy, there'd be a great view of Niragongo in the background. But right at the base of Goma Volcano Observatory is this, just a big football pitch. So that's a bunch of schools locally playing football kind of at all hours of the day. Okay. Right at the base and, of and <laughs> compared even to um, Honolulu or Hilo, for example, all seems to be low rise, um, you know, the, the buildings seem to be quite different. Um, that must have been a, a bit of a culture shock for you. Yeah, I've spent time in Africa before, I've spent time in developing countries before, and Congo was a new planet. <laughs> Congo has its own architecture, its own way of doing simple things like traffic lights. Instead of having traffic lights, they have robotic police that wave around red and oh, green lights right. into the traffic. Let's There's take a look at another yeah. slide as well. Now this looks a bit more scientific. I can at least see in this black and white image, um, you've got some old lava flows in the foreground. So this is actually the site of the 2002 eruption. And this is the shanty town I was mentioning earlier. So this is all fairly recent in the grand scheme of things for Niragongo. And this is where we were doing the CO2 measurements. And, and is this the rift zone? Yeah, I'm pretty much standing on top of the rift itself to take this photo. So this is even more extreme than Ocean View Estates on the Big Island, where you know, here you've got a lot of people with relatively poorly constructed housing right in the middle of an active rift zone or a part of the volcano which is starting to split apart. And that's where they're still seeing active activity. And, that's where, I, and the next slide, I think, well, you, you actually were measuring some of this. So. Um, oh, <laughs> oh no! This, <laughs> this is interesting. This was not a measurement. This is hopefully <laughs> running away, but what, what, what is it we're seeing This here? was uh, right outside the seismic station. Um, we turned around the corner driving away from looking at the seismic station, and we ran right into these guys who were with the Congolese army, and this is my one exception to my rule of taking pictures of local forces with guns, because that's a rocket launcher on one shoulder and a belt-fed machine gun on the other. And, and a seismic station is actually a geophysics technique. We yes. had Niels Groby come in recently to talk on the show about geophysics. But here, weren't you scared? You know, I, I didn't know if I would be, and I discovered that my reaction to seeing heavily armed people was smiling and waving, um, <laughs> since this came up several a times. Way of protecting yourself? I or? was like, hi, I, well, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm not going to like win an argument with somebody yeah. with a rocket launcher. Right, right, sure. But he saluted. And, like, and, and <laughs> was this a relatively common sight or? Uh, heavily armed, yes. Rocket launcher, no. Okay. So that was the only time I had a run in with a full on RPG in the Congo. All right, let's take a look but, at another one. And so th this looks uh, a much more friendly it, group. 
who are, who are the two gentlemen next to you? So we have one of the head geochemists to my left. With his thumbs up is my friend Moni, who was largely driving me and is responsible for all of the hazards um, communications in Goma. And this does look much more friendly, doesn't it? Um, it does? We didn't You're going to tell me something to the make me worry. We didn't realize that when that photo was taken, about 20 feet behind us was a man in a full black trench coat with an AK-47 waiting to see who we were when we came back up. Um, not a so good thing. I said no. to my friend with the thumbs up there, I just said, gun. He said, rebel. <laughs> but the, the background in that particular image, it mm. looks kind of like rainforest here in Hawaii. Are they the kind of working conditions that the volcanologists at Goma have to do working all the time? So that was where a feeder for the 2002 eruption was. That was a continuation of the same fissure system that hadn't actively erupted but had split. So that's where we were doing the extensional measurements I was talking about. And one of the big things that was up there is that's where the rebels are. Uh -huh. which, like I said, wasn't as abstract as I thought it was. And um, that was much more dense jungle, whereas a lot of the work was done in kind of open clearings or in urban areas. So that was one of the only actual jungle settings we had for work. OK. Now, I'm sure many of the viewers are saying, how does this young man get to the point where he can be invited to go to Central Africa to study volcanoes. So can you tell us a little bit about your background, please, Juan? So I have uh, degrees in political science and linguistics from the University of Texas at Austin, and I have a geosciences degree from here at UH. And so I've kind of always had an interest in uh, disadvantaged communities and lesser served communities, mm -hmm. and particularly with a geology background from a hazards perspective. A lot of places that face volcanic hazards don't have adequate international support to actively monitor those hazards. Okay, and what's your basic skill set? Yeah. So, <laughs> you sounded quite eclectic, Ooh. your background. Uh, so, uh, right now, you're a volcanologist? Or? I primarily consider myself a volcanologist. Okay. I, uh, with a passing interest and degree in political science and linguistics right. in general. So we've had other students on this show, uh, like Estelle at Boney, um, who are doing remote sensing studies of gases. We had Niels Groby on a few weeks ago, who's the geophysicist. Where would you fit into the spectrum of people who study volcanoes? I'm probably much more of a geochemist. Okay. I'm much more used to looking at the elemental makeup of different rocks and volcanoes and looking at the history which, of volcanoes. Which means you'll take a rock sample into the lab, maybe make a thin section or put it into an iron microprobe. Or exactly. That sort of thing, okay, to learn what? what? What's the whole point? To learn the behavior of the volcano, to learn why it's erupting the way it is, to learn what it might do in the future, if you can understand yeah. that from the samples you're taking. But obviously I work with Martian samples and a little further away data. <laughs> right, 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 right. And, and you're just about to finish your master's degree. So uh, how does this prepare you? you know, what, what, what do you think your career path would be? Uh, are you going to return to some of the, uh, the, the more political sciences kinds of things, or are you going to focus on, on volcano studies? I, I love volcanoes too much. Uh -huh. I enjoyed political science for when I did it, but uh, my heart's in volcanoes. And I want to keep working towards a PhD, and I want to stay in academia, and I want to keep working with volcanoes. Even if I'm working on Mars primarily, which is one thing I really would like to continue doing, there's still that side human element that doesn't require a full life's worth of research to do any good. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's just take a look at one or two of the other images. Um, this one seems to be similar. Is that correct? Where we've got... Um, so one of the things that was really shocking to me in Goma is you spend all of your life hearing about, like, Medicines Without uh, Frontiers, uh, the UN forces that come in, the anti-landmine organizations working on demining UNICEF, and you cross the border into Goma, and there they all are. Really? And so I was kind of desperate to get a picture of some UN guys, because uh, <laughs> I don't want to take pictures of people with guns, but the UN, uh, they're probably not going to start okay. a huge incident, which I was slightly wrong about. But um, no, that was, a, uh, that was a soldier who was just kind of waiting for his CO at breakfast, and it was a good shot, so I took it. <laughs> And you're in this environment. Um, is it personally safe? I mean, uh, if I said yes, I'd be lying. If you <laughs> said yes, you'd be lying. I wasn't. And this is a setup. I think um, it, it, it wasn't a particularly. Um, the whole trip 
had some eventful moments in life. So I was in one of the most dangerous countries in the world in one of the more dangerous places. Uh, I was perfectly safe the entire time I was there, even my run-in with that rebel. Right. He just asked if we were volcanologists and was like, oh, okay, fine, have a nice day. Uh -huh. uh, but yes, my trip to the airport was <laughs> a little rougher. And I think we will see the last but one slide in, in the deck um, will actually show um, what, what you're talking about. All right, so this looks horrible, even if this was here on Oahu, somewhere in Central Africa. Explain so, what we're seeing here. Juan. So this is about halfway between Goma and Kigali in Rwanda, so the capital of Rwanda. Okay. And uh, that car is not meant to be upside down. It just decided to do that when a motorcycle cut us off. And I had glass go through my head and arm. I ended up missing my flight because I was in a Congolese hospital, uh, one person in the car. And, and here we see, um, dear viewer, this is Warren a few <laughs> weeks ago. Um, you can obviously tell that he has uh, recovered fairly well. Yeah, I walked away pretty unscathed. You can see our, uh, our guardian angels back there. We actually had a bus full of university students from Alabama was the first thing that I was able to flag down. Uh -huh. which is extremely unlikely in a country that doesn't have much English spoken. Did you have to go to a hospital? Oh yeah, I was... Isn't that disconcerting in terms of you know, well, and uh, their medical capabilities as good of as they are here? The reasons I used the term guardian angels was because one of them lived there and actually knew which one was the best hospital. Okay. So we drove past two other hospitals on the way to the one hospital which apparently had sufficient standards to be okay. Did you have a blood transfusion? Or I didn't need it. I lost a fair bit of blood, but uh, oh, that thankfully it stopped. That would worry me. That would worry. Well, it was also three hours before the missile alert in Hawaii. <laughs> so I was on the phone with my wife when suddenly I got stopped because there was another crisis on the other side of the world. Yeah. And so it was a bit of a stressful day. <laughs> and so your right arm seems yeah, to be just... me mending well. Yeah, they were. At Queens, they were completely happy with the work that was done in Rwanda, so I've got a few battle scars to show for it, but for an overturned vehicle in the middle of Africa, it could have been very fortunate, very fortunate. much worse. Now, would you go back again? I absolutely would. Really? Uh, I would probably take the roads in Rwanda a little slower, uh -huh. but the Congolese people were wonderful. The Congolese scientists were just some of the most dedicated people I've ever met in my life, working with you know, incredibly difficult conditions and very little in the way of scientific equipment and doing some really good and impactful research. And so the, the research potential on Nirungongo, and I guess there's Naimuagiro, which is an yep. adjacent volcano as well, similarly very interesting. And um, there's just so much to be done and so much in the way of actually helping protect this population of a million, but in the meantime, you have like massive armed conflict kind of potentially brewing over at any moment. And you mentioned earlier that scientists from the Volcano Observatory come to Hawaii. Um, do you know if they've got any more plans to send people here? Uh, my friend who's actually driving the car is uh, looking at doing sea save uh -huh. and coming over and he's their emergency manager so he's responsible for uh, in the Congo, emergency manager also involves hand painting every single one of the hazard signs for a city of a million people in multiple <laughs> languages. So he works hard. Quite, quite a challenge. Yeah. Well, alas, well, the show's coming to an end. Uh, it sounds as if you're trying to get back there again. So hopefully, if you are successful, you'll be safe, first of all. But then if you come back, it'd be great to have you back on the show again to give us an update on what Volcano. So thank you once again for well, being so on the show. And reminding the viewers, you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness Mark, and my guest today has been Warren McKenzie, who is a graduate student within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. So thanks for watching, and join us in two weeks' time, given President's Day next week, uh, when we'll have another guest to introduce you to. So bye for now.